Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Today, Holy Communion. If you don't have the ingredients, take time out, go get them, and be set, for we're going to the table of the Lord before this hour is over with, and we just thank our Father for the privilege of serving Him. What, what is Passover all about? And we come to that time of the year. Passover is when the people were held captive in Egypt. And Almighty God, through miracles, the, basically the same miracles as the vials in the great book of Revelation, performed to deliver his children, just as he'll do again. But it was primarily to have the blood of the lamb on your doorpost. So the death angel had to pass over. Therefore, we have Passover. It's to cause the angel of death and trouble and destruction, which is to say Satan or any of his evil spirits, to have to pass over your house. Why? Because it has the blood of the lamb. Now through Holy Communion, inasmuch as Christ became our Passover. When did it start? all the way back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. When God, our Heavenly Father, told Satan, I put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. You shall bruise his heel, and this is where he was nailed to the cross. But he's going to bust your head. That's my words, but that's exactly what the Hebrew means. And that hasn't happened, but it's going to. But that's why you want to be under that veil, that protection of the Lord Jesus Christ through Holy Communion, which is our Passover. Many might say, well, you mean Christ became our Passover? That's what it says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. He became our Passover. In other words, his blood, when you're under it, Satan has no choice but to pass over you to leave you alone. Why? Because if you, have the, if you have the brass to exercise the authority that he's given you over all your enemies. So that choice is yours. So we go to the time that all this began to take place in the in-depth meaning as 315 was fulfilled when he was nailed to that cross. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to pick it up in verse 29. Listen carefully to these words. Um, and when they have arrested, they have taken Christ, the Romans have, and uh, they are giving him a trial. And we pick it up there, verse 29. And when they had platted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, which he was not King of Judah. He was the King of all Israel in the world, okay? Verse 30. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. Those are the guys we want to get a hold of in the millennium. 31. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to to crucify him. That's why you pick up your cross, you follow him. You want to be willing to do exactly that. That is to say, stand firm and make a difference. Verse 32, And as they came out, they found a man of Sorini, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear the cross, and he did. Verse 33, And when they came unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull. It, in the Hebrew, it's Golgotha. In Latin, it's Calvary, and uh, rather Calvaria, and in English, Calvary. That old skull mountain there where he was led up. 
34, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And of course, this is fulfilling prophecy whereby it was written that they would do this, but really it was a Roman soldier's poor man's wine, trying to give him something, you know, most people, they're crucified and the spikes, a little painkiller along the way. He refused it. 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Psalms 22, 22. And, and uh, so it is that our father, 18, 22, that the Roman soldiers would gamble for his clothing written a thousand years before the fact. I wish I could just believe the word. Then if you couldn't believe that, then you're hopeless, absolutely out of luck. Even the words we're reading here will be repeated, were repeated, I should say, get our tenses proper here, way before the fact, a thousand years to be exact. 36, and sitting down, they watched him there. He claimed to be really something. Let's, let's take all this in. 37, and they set up over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And naturally, um, again, I would repeat, that would only be one tribe. He was king of all Israel. And after the crucifixion, he became king to the whole world and all peoples. 38, then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And here he is right in the middle between two malefactors, this in itself fulfilling scripture, where he would um, be hung with um, these. And, and um, as it is written in the great book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 12. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. Remember that. Mocking, ridiculing. Hey, there's nothing new under the sun. They do it still to this day about Christians and our Savior. Verse 40, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. That's what he said he could do. Save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Remember that. Now, what did he say, though? He said, if you destroy this temple, I could build it in three days. What temple was he talking about? If you read Revelation chapter 21, verses 20 through 24, you know the eternal um, city has no temple because God and the Son are the temple thereof. He's talking about the many-membered body that resurrected at that time, along with his having resurrected, giving power and authority. And he started building that new temple instantly. Three days, I mean, after, immediately after the resurrection, he knocked on that door. He released many, even all the way back to Noah, that would believe upon him, as it is written in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. 41. Likewise, also the chief priests mocked him. Listen to this. Which the scribes and elders said, with the scribes and elders said, 42, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, and here they've got it right, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. No, they wouldn't have. No way would they have believed him. Why? Because they're non-believers. Verse 43, he trusted in God. Remember these words. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. They continue mocking him. And of course, this also is repeated in Psalms 22. Christ is taking all this in. It's not, it's his, his ears are picking up on it. 44, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. One finally was converted, though, as we know. 45, 
Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Father always uses certain things for signs and wonders at crucial times. Well, what exactly did that mean? Well, from 12 noon till 3 p.m., it was dark, right in the middle of the day. Oh, I would think that would be a little unusual. Well, they should have. This is to show you nothing would have caused them to believe. Did cause a little doubt, though. Verse 46. And about the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane. And that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, and, and this just really shatters a lot of little Christians. God left Jesus all alone while he was hanging on the cross. Don't show your ignorance. He's repeating Psalms 22, which all these sayings and things that were happening at his very feet are foretold of a thousand years before the fact. He was the teacher of teachers, and he is teaching. Number one, you should, as a Christian, be a little bit aware that uh, Father never called God, uh, Jesus never called God El. He always called him Father, not God. I'll say it again. Jesus never addressed Father as God. But David did, and that's exactly what he's doing here is quoting Psalms 22. And in Psalms 22, we're going to cover it because it's very interesting that within this Psalms, I hope you locked in the words we read in the events that were transpiring right at the foot of the cross so that you know and it can anchor your belief of a surety, of a guarantee. God, your Father, always keeps His Word. And Christ, a teacher of teachers, taught right up to the end with His very last breaths in the flesh body. Though He never died, He resurrected. And even while in the tomb, He was knocking on Satan's door, freeing people from His clutches because He had paid the price that whosoever should put that... Uh, lamb's blood on the door, I speak spiritually, they're saved. That's what he's in the business of, is saving souls. So as he was on that cross, he repeated Psalms 22, verse 1. I will quote it in the Hebrew first. Eli, Eli, lama shabbatene. Now let's read it in English so that you remember what Jesus said. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This was David. Okay. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring, my, my lamentation, my sad song? Why can't you help me, David said. David had a pretty hard time of it, though he was a brave soul. Verse 2. Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. I, I get no rest day or night. I'm crying out to you. Don't you ever worry. God always hears you. Always. Verse 3. But thou art holy. Still we see the reverence here. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Why? Because he earns it. Four. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. Let me tell you something. Your father always delivers if you believe upon him. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is always with you. Verse 5. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were never confounded. They were never disgraced. And if you stand your ground and stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never be disgraced either. 
you may have some silly heads that'll wrap off uh, ratchet join against religion. But I hope that doesn't make you ashamed because you can proudly say you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that paid this price that we can attain salvation. Verse 6, But I am a worm, and no man a reproach of men and despised of the people. This, is a, a, this, this word is tolo, which is a crimson worm used for dye. And, and, um, and I, I'm sure he felt that way, bloodied up, so to speak. I'm talking about David, as this psalm was written, a thousand years before Christ was crucified. But Christ repeating every word, I'll document that before we finish, repeated every word of this psalm while he hang on, was hung on that cross. Seven, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, and they shake the head saying, verse eight, you ready for it? Listen, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him. And therefore that 43rd verse should ring in your ears, coming to pass exactly as it was written, just as he was hanging on that cross, would come to pass. What does that do? Well, it should document in your heart and mind. Who was it that said that? It was the enemies of Christ. But how possibly could the enemies of Christ repeat words in prophecy? Who's on the throne? Your heavenly Father is always on the throne. He's in charge. He's in control. And he did this for you, that you could know and would understand. You can trust his word. It always comes to pass exactly as it's written. Therefore, great comfort can be held within that. I mean, even the chief priest himself spouting these words, the very enemy that would demand his crucifixion, documenting to you that you'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the word of the living God. He that became the word flesh and walked among us, that you'll never be ashamed in holding that ground, knowing and loving him, knowing and understanding him. Verse 9 to continue. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I've loved you from a child onward, even before I was born. David speaking. 10. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. And, and they had, they had scattered all but John. John, told, uh, John was told by the Lord Jesus Christ to take Mary and, and, and leave the, the, the area. And so it was. But there he was alone. Died alone with the exception of a few women that stayed on the hill far away. It was inside. He did this for you. Do you know why? He thinks you're worth it. I guess you can answer that question, but he did it for you, that on paying this price, that you could find that salvation, which cost him terribly, but he never whimpered, he never whined, he paid that price, why? Because he loves you. You need to return that love if you want his blessings. Verse 12, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. Bashan is known for, for its fertile ground and huge animals there. 13, they gapped up on me with their mouths as a raving and a roaring lion. They, they shoot their lip out at me. They mock me. You know, it is... Do you think it really bothered Christ to be put through? No, it didn't. 
bothers me, though, and it should bother you also, that he had to go through this for us. And But again, he didn't whimper and he didn't complain. But I think it would not be asking too much of you to return that love that this was real love that he gave himself for you. Again, why? Because he thinks you're worth it. Uh, many other people might have a different opinion about you as to whether you'd be worth it or not. But he, he didn't even question it. He thinks you are. Even though he may not agree with what you do, he does love you. And, and um, uh, that's why he created your very being. Because he wanted someone like you. But there they were, shooting their lip at him, mocking him, calling him names. Verse 14, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. In other words, my arms nailed to this cross are pulled from socket as he hanged there. He did that for you again. And life itself in the flesh was drifting away. And with that would come the fulfillment and um, that uh, all this was held within. Never a complaint. Now, this prophecy would never fit anyone but the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, that should strengthen your faith in the Word of God. That something that happened word for word, deed for deed, act for act, a thousand years before the fact, from an entire city and group of people, a country, going down exactly as it was written, no man can arrange that. But God can. And most of all, God did. And that should strengthen your faith beyond any waver or doubt that Satan could put in your path to know the love of Almighty God as His only begotten Son, Emmanuel, God with us, suffered this for us. Well, why did He do it? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Came to this earth to be crucified in the flesh so that I could destroy death, which is to say the devil. He did it overall to bring salvation, but to destroy the devil, even one of his own creation. 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, like an old broken piece of pottery. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, I'm so dry. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. In other words, the, the, the day is slipping away. Dust is on and night is coming. As strength would leave that flesh, but never the spirit body that was there. Verse 16, for dogs, this, this is, translates enemies, for enemies have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. They nailed him to that cross. Again, fulfilling the first prophecy in God's Word. That is to say, Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, where it was said that that serpent and his offspring would pierce him. And that came to pass, and that was written 3,000, 4,000 years before the fact. What would it take to make a believer out of a non-believer? Truth will always do it. But one must be intelligent enough to want to absorb the truth and to look at the facts and chronologically sort out the events that God has promised, for it has always come to pass exactly as it is written. Have you ever read it? Many times when Christ was walking the earth, they would ask him a question, and he would say, haven't you read? Why? Because it's plainly in the Word of God. Therefore, you to read all the time. Have you read it? 
Do you remind God of the promises that he's made to you? Well, well, what promises is that? Forget it. You're out. You have to read the promises. And as it is written in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26, God talking to you, remind you, me of the promises I have made to you. I mean, he hasn't forgotten what he wants to know. Have you read? And then he says, we'll talk about it so that I can justify you, so that I can treat you right. A lot of people, well, he never does anything for me. Well, why should he? If you never study the promises, if you don't know the word and could care less, then he cares less about you. Time about fair play, the way it should be. It's up to you. He has given you your own ship, spiritually speaking. You're sailing it. If you want to take it on the rocks, hey, have a good trip. If you want salvation, and if you want Christ in that boat with you, your spiritual boat, where you'll never hit a storm or the rocks that you can't survive, that you can't overcome, then get Christ in the boat with you. Hang on to him there. He proved to you through these acts that he loves you enough that he would give himself for you then you can rest all the more assured that he's never going to leave you and he's never going to forsake you. That you can come unfastened from the hang-ups of this world and dwell in him and he in you and have a lot better sailing in that Christian ship. So let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 17. I may tell all my bones, they look and they stare upon me. And, and so it was, alone he was doing this. 18, they part my garments among them and they cast lots upon my vesture. There it is, verse 18. Written of, long, uh, long later it would be written when the Roman soldiers themselves, showing off, giving him a reed like a staff, like he was the king. And then at the same time, wanting that robe with no seam in it so badly that they would gamble for it. But the main thing is that it had no seam in the making of the garment, but there's no seam in the word of God. It flows like like water over the buds of honey and honey over the buds of your mind, giving you an unbroken truth whereby you could be strengthened by the love of Almighty God that His Word comes to pass exactly as it's written, the same as Roman soldiers gambling, casting lots a thousand years after the fact. At right on cue, right on time. Well, I, I, how did Jesus get the Roman soldiers? Father did. Father never forsook him. He will never forsake anybody. And he arranged it in his word coming out the gate long ago. That's why you can count on it. For God is the same yesterday he is today and he shall be forever. His word never changes. Verse 19. Be not far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. He always does, beloved. You can rest assured. But ask him. When you need help, don't be shy. Don't be bashful. Ask him. You don't even have to say it out loud. Verse 20. Deliver my soul. From the sword, my darling, the word darling should be translated soul, the same word in the Hebrew. My soul from the power of the dog, that is to say the enemy. Deliver me from that enemy, and God did. Not only did he deliver this one from the enemy, but he will you as well. Because he loves you. You see, many might say, well, this sounds like he went through a lot of trouble. He, it was, he did it for you. Again, I will say, because he thinks you're worth it. Again, the world might have a lot of different opinion. 
But that doesn't matter. What matters is what he thinks of you. He thinks you're worth it, that he paid this price. He brought all these events together whereby they would transpire, laying out a plan of salvation and documenting his ability to bring actions to pass exactly as they're written, whereby you could know when he promises you eternal life, he'll be there. You can count on it. When he promises you salvation, to, if you believe upon him, if you believe upon this word, for he is this word, then you have that eternal life. All these events transpired documenting in your mind if you will receive it. But you can count on him. He'll never leave you. He will never forsake you. That's the lead verse of this, of this very psalm. A psalm of David, but foretelling many, many uh, uh, years later, a thousand of them to be exact, exactly what would transpire exactly how it would come down in the end times that you could claim that salvation that you could pertain it would pertain to you i said you for it does pertain to you always let him know you love him we'll be back in just a moment listen a moment won't you please the mark of the beast on cd is our free introductory offer to you what is the mark of the beast Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the, we'll, we'll uh, get right on into the scripture here. Again, our Father doing this for you. Whereby, and it's such a wonderful, beautiful thing. But I, I find it difficult in my heart and mind, body and soul to understand why somebody wouldn't be thrilled to have our Father love them protect them and care for them their buffer in life you know you go through this life without that buffer and you can end up in a heap of hurt so we'll return again to Christ's words as he was upon that cross and how precious it is that that he did this and he did it for you don't, don't forget whatever you do to thank him. Let him know you appreciate him and love him. Okay, Pays great dividends. All right, let's continue with the next verse, verse 21. Save me now from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. There's no such thing as a unicorn, and this word in the Hebrew is wild ox. Verse 22, a famous verse right here. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And you have to be real pleased with this because I quoted Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 a moment ago. This is verse 12. It's verse 12 in that great book of Hebrews where you, as a member of that congregation, what congregation? The temple. The temple he promised he would build, rebuild in three days, the many-membered body. That that truth would be repeated. And then, then he goes on in that uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and explains that you will 
carry this message forward to that congregation, and we do, all the way around the world. And in that 14th verse, the reason being that he came in the flesh was so he would have no problem destroying death, which is to say the devil. But then as you continue on, you learn a beautiful lesson in that second chapter of Hebrews. That, that he himself, if he asked you to come through this earth age in the flesh, that he wanted to show you that he could do it, only he did it perfect. Okay. We don't. We're not perfect. But he showed us how it can be done in perfection. What a father you have. You, you want to listen to him. You want to obey him. <clears throat> and there again, in that second chapter of Hebrews, he has a message there that is so ever comforting that he would never leave you, he'll never forsake you, but mainly he will never have you do something he didn't do himself. And, and, um, and he suffered, he could have suffered a lot, but he, his love overpowered the suffering, his love for you. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 23. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. This, this fear is an interesting Hebrew word. As you've heard me say many times, it translates both ways, revere, just as easily as fear. And, and, and fear itself is awesome in its own sense that you can reverence him and love him and know that he did this for us, so how could you but help revere him? 24, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. Don't ever forget that. It's important that you remember it, especially at this time, because it, it, I'm going to tell you it's a little weakness of Christians that they just have to, I just wonder if he heard me, but that's that is a bad thing to say. He always hears you, but he always answers as to what is best for you. Con that is to say, best for you in the destiny that he possesses for you to accomplish what it is that you are to accomplish. For everybody has a purpose, everybody has a destiny especially in this generation of the end times when the false messiah is very soon upon us. And that congregation must be addressed. And that many-membered body is going to do it. That's what he meant in that Hebrews chapter 2. And, and so it is. Don't you ever doubt that he hears you. What? Well, it's real simple, because he loves you. And if you love him and trust him enough, you know that for him to hear is all that's necessary, because he's going to deal with it that is best for you. And, and never question that. Simply question, how can I better serve you? And if he asks, who can I send? Say, send me. Be ready to serve. And Father will always appreciate that. Next verse, verse 25. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. And so it is, that love him, that revere him. I, I would much rather translate this revere because we do. You can't help but revere him. I, you know, the reason I, I know it should have been translated revere is God doesn't hold people by fear. He holds them by love. Uh, and why, you can't help wanting to follow him when you see the love that he has poured out upon you. 
you, you would not want to go in any other direction other than following him. He that paved the way, he that made it so easy to serve him, to love him, 26, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. That's, that's the humble. Okay. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever and ever. You know, seeking takes a little on your part, but I'm just going to sit back here and wait. Oh, you are. Well, then, you know, you're going to have a long wait. Seek means exactly that. Seek, search, find, read, investigate, study. Study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of God, whereby you're worth something. He can count on you. This word will never change. And hopefully you won't. And so it is that we do love him. And humbly, not with the big head, not on an ego trip, but humbly serving him because it is from him that all wisdom, all knowledge comes. If you want to get yourself shut off from receiving the wonderful truths of the end times, then, then be something other than humble and see how quick he helps you out. Verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. On that first day of the millennium, what happens? Every knee shall bow before the Lord God Almighty. Every knee. Even the enemy themselves will bow. Well, why? Well, the false one will have been here. He would have done his little thing. And then comes the truth. With all power and all control. And the very awesomeness of his presence. They can't help but bow to him. That is to say to, to um, know and to worship the awesomeness. But the, the problem is how long... Or are they affected by the awesomeness of his presence uh, as long as they are meek and humble and follow him? Or do they rise back up again, as it is written, many will, and go to hell? It's always each person's choice. Verse 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's. Nobody else's, the Lord's. That's the king and his dominion. That's everything. And he is the governor among the nations. You, you don't need to look somewhere else. You don't need to look to some political party or some nation or something. No, it doesn't do any good. We have one father. It's going to happen exactly as our creator has given us the right, the power, and the leadership Verse 29, and they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. There is no way that you can work your own salvation. You need him. He has it all worked out for you. That, that, if you listen to him and if you follow the path that he has set forth, hey, anyone can do that. You don't, you don't even have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer to know that if somebody dies for you and showed you page by page and deed by deed what you had to do to find that salvation, well, how easy it is to love him that loved you so much. Love is a beautiful thing, that especially one that would love you enough, regardless of your shortcomings, regardless of your faults, to love you enough to die for you, and, and hanging on a cross. Did it for you. Shed that blood that you, on your doorpost, every evil thing must pass over it. And when you're out past that doorpost even, 
you have the brass to order anything evil out of your path. Take charge. That's what God's people can do because he has given us that power and that authority, not over just a few, but as it is written in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, all your enemies, every last one of them, you have power over them. It's a wonderful thing to be able to live forever. Let's go with the next verse. That's what he promises. Verse 30. A seed shall serve him. That, that's a generation, okay? It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Do you know what generation we're talking about? It's a generation that we, you need to be familiar with. It's talking about you, the generation of the fig tree. A generation that knows how to handle the fig tree and again goes all the way back to the beginning. Well, how can you possibly think that the fig tree, the parable of the fig tree goes to the beginning? Well, what did Adam and Eve cover themselves with when they realized they had sinned? Hmm? What did they cover themselves with? Fig leaves. Because that sin happened in a fig grove. And that generation of the fig tree, that he would be good enough to those that love him, that he would even give you the set of sequences that would transpire so that you would know when that generation was living on this earth. You combine that with the New Testament as well as, as uh, Jeremiah chapter 24, and you have the parable of the fig tree, and so it is. But what you have in that 30th verse is he remembered you today, that he remembered that generation. To complete verse 31, they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Now, as I told you, I would document the fact that the fact that he hath done this is the equivalent to John chapter 1930, his final words on the cross, it is finished, which is the last phrase in Psalms 22, whereby he gave the whole Psalms. But the whole point was that that generation, the generation of the fig tree, would come to a people that would be born in the future, today. After Israel would become a nation again, as it is written, both good figs and bad figs planted there, declaring it. That when that happened, that generation would not pass away until all these scriptures would be fulfilled. That's why that generation is ever, ever so important. And that's why he was thinking of you at that time. So we come to that place. We come to that place where you realize, having read that all this came to pass a thousand years before the fact, and 4,000 years before some of it became a fact. Your father knows exactly what he's doing. And he does want that congregation to do the things that he declared unto them that they should do. It's for a purpose. Believe it or not, it's to help the unbeliever, to save as many of God's children. Why? Because he loves them all. He doesn't love what they're doing, but he does love all of his children. And this is the reason he would destroy that one who is death, which is to save the devil. But within that, the love flows that he did this. And as I stated earlier, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, he became our Passover. He became our Passover through the table of the Lord. So I hope you have all the ingredients there, and we're going to go at this time to that table of the Lord. 
So we would take the bread, and this bread is his body. And as it is written in Isaiah 53, his body took the stripes so our bodies can receive the heat. It is ever so important. On the night that our Father, through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take ye and eat ye all of it. O oh, Heavenly Father, as the unleavened bread comes into our body, his body with ours, he and us and we and him, that we grow and that love grows and that we open ourselves to be his servant with his healing and with his blessing. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. Soon after, he took the cup and he blessed it. And this being that blood that washes away all sin. So repent of all your sins right now. Repent. And Father, we come repentant before you at this time. And soon after, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood that is shed for many. Take ye and drink ye all of it. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the privilege of serving you. We thank you, Father, for this table of the Lord. Thank you, Father, for the many miracles that happen because of this, because you touch your children with love and with understanding that they have that better life with sure and certain knowledge that you love them and that you have done these things for them, for each of us, that we could have that power and that authority, your power, that we could assist in helping the children believe, helping them to understand the truth and the way of Almighty God. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this table. How precious it is, the table of the Lord, that leads us, that guides us, that gives us that personal touch, hand in hand, heart in heart, mind in mind, one body, one many-membered body, serving him and rolling over that that would get in its way to bring eternal peace and eternal life to this world. How precious it is that our Father loves his children to this point. You know, I, I know that we disappoint him at times. I know that time does not mean that much to him as it does to us. He has plenty of time. I know in the first earth age that we hurt him terribly. A third of the children, I mean, turned their back on him. And I fear to say that more than a third today turned their back upon him. And yet at the same time, in this world, I know that it gnaws at them, that there's more to life than they've found. There's a great deal more that can be attained by loving him. This does not mean you become a welcoming mat, doormat, that is to say, for people to walk on. We're not second-class citizens. We take ground. We don't give it up because you're a child of the living God. And those people that our Father scattered, as he promised he would, all over the world, they're beginning to come together 
with the precious convenience that we have in high technology in these end times to spread the truth around the world is an easy, easy thing. It's simply the push of one button. It gets done. How, how precious our Father is that he always has that equalizer for those that love him, and that equalizer is the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you never want to be ashamed of believing his gospel, for it is God's spell, it is God's news, and that's the good news. When you hear all the bad news, push it to one side a little bit, you can kind of read the Word of God and find where it was promised. Did it come to pass, prophesied? All you got to do is open your eyes and look at it. And then you don't have to worry, and you never have to doubt. Why? You have a covering. You're under the wing of Almighty God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He the living Word that was with God from the beginning, the Word was God, that it became flesh and walked with, walked with us, walked with on this earth, showing us how to do it right. Always remember that. What a blessing it is that we have this table of the Lord. We thank our Father for the privilege. And I thank all of you for having taken that table with us. We have God's blessings and that he is with us, that he leads us, he guides us, and he directs us when you believe upon him. You have a choice. You can go the other way. But serving him, it's a lot easier. Always remember this one thing. I, I almost insist that you stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day. You know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. I'm enjoying these kind of specials we're doing and kind of updating some tapes that we did quite some time back. The appointed time. That's the subject. Anytime our Father states something in His Word, then, then 